Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I don't know if people are just enjoying the warmer weather or if they knew the text that I'm going to be preaching on today and they stayed away on purpose. You'll get that more later. <laughs> um, good morning. Good. Great to have you in worship this morning. Uh, direct your attention to the back of your bulletin. No uh, um, huge announcements there. There's some needs, uh, worship, and uh, otherwise that you can read about. Um, I, I, as you can see, I am mass free today. I asked the council. We're, we're getting close. There's little bits of uh, lights on the COVID front that, um, and they agreed that it would be okay for me to uh, speak without a mask. So I hope you're okay with that. If you aren't, if you want to move back or uh, let me know if that's not okay with you, I appreciate any of those comments. But hopefully it's the same coming for you soon. But uh, we're still in conversation with that. Uh, we're still asking that during the service you be masked and such. So uh, we're, we're looking at all those questions about when can we have coffee again? When can we uh, do other things that we, uh, you know, kind of the normal things. Uh, and we're having those conversations. So I just want to let you know that. Um, and thank you for your continued patience on all of that. But hopefully uh, it's good. Finally, you can see the expressions and you're not seeing me pull down my mask all the time. I know it's uh, been frustrating at that point. So thank you again for all of your patience with that. Uh, just to let you know that, uh, and you'll see in the newsletter that's coming out, uh, the Lenten schedule, we are planning on doing a Wednesday evening services starting with Ash Wednesday on March 2nd. And then Wednesday evening services uh, at seven o'clock each of those nights. Um, it's going to be uh, more contemplative. We're not sure exactly what the service will look like, some music, some readings, uh, but then we're also gonna uh, focus on uh, just having a time of, of listening uh, together. Um, I'm gonna use a practice called Lectio Divina, which is reading a text and then having some conversation with you uh, about that text. So that's gonna be the format for our Lenten season this year. I encourage you, if you are able, you know it's evening, so it's a little more challenging to get out and drive and that kind of thing. But if you're able, I'd uh, love to have you participate in that. Uh, I don't know of any other uh, imminent prayer concerns or things that aren't that aren't listed there. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns to be noted? If not, I invite you to stand and join with me as we share our confession and forgiveness on page one of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome, and accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may be in the glory of your Son born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Our hymn, All Creatures Worship God Most High, uh, 835. We're going to sing just the, the top four verses there. There's six of them. Uh, we'll just sing the, the top four that are uh, in the uh, printed music there.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace, that where there is hatred, we may so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is despair, hope. Grant, O divine Master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. reading, which is from the balcony today, is from Genesis chapter 45. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve, preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and after that his brothers talked with him. Word of God, word of life. Amen. The psalm is Psalm 37, 1 through 11, and 39 through 40. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so that you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. But still, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. 
It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking and says, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Barbara Lundblad is a ELCA pastor. She's also a preaching professor out in Union Seminary, or where she was at least the last time I knew. Um, she's a, kind of a headliner if you ever get, uh, we get notices about preaching workshops or conventions. She's usually one who is there either giving a workshop or a headline speaker. But she recalls a time when she was a pastor in New York and was driving and came up, uh, to a stop and noticed on the right there was a church and right outside the church a large uh, billboard or a large uh, sign and on it of course was the sermon title for the next week. And that sermon title was Following Jesus is Loving and Practical. Following Jesus is loving and practical. Now what she did next, I can identify exactly with. She started to go, is that right? She started to argue kind of in her head and then out loud because she was the only one in the car and she could do that without sounding crazy, but she started arguing. Is following Jesus always loving and practical? And she started a list, and I did this all the time because we had a, a church across the way, and unfortunately I probably shouldn't have done it as often as I did, but they, I had to confront the theology that was out there all the time. My people were seeing it on the road. 
And so, you know, like her, I, start, I can argue with, like she did, she started to argue and list things that, you know, yes, Jesus, following Jesus is loving and helps us love one another, but is it practical? And as she started to list all the ways in which Jesus spoke to us how to act and live, she was, you know, that isn't practical. She got cut off because the light turned green and the guy behind her honked and she never got to finish the list. But as she recalled back, as she hit this text one Sunday, she recalled that incident. And she wondered what that pastor actually preached that Sunday and what it means that following Jesus is loving and practical. Obviously, he hadn't dealt with this text in a while. I've always wanted, when I come upon this text, that Jesus is speaking on, on it's, it's the Sermon on the Plain. Remember last week, Justin did a great job of introducing us to this uh, Sermon on the Plain here in Luke. It's Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, remember? And Matthew goes up on the mountain and teaches. And uh, here in Luke, he's on the level plain and is teaching these same things. It's the same thing. It's just that Matthew and Luke are writing to different audiences. And Matthew is more into dealing with the mountain, connecting with the mountain, uh, than uh, Luke is concerned about. But either way, uh, we heard the, the lesson last week from Justin so well about the woes and the blessings that Jesus taught us. And he does so too, it says, a great crowd of his disciples. But did you notice how today's text began? It started by saying, but I say to you that are listening, and it might be better translated actually by saying, I declare to you who are listening. Or even better, you could emphasize the, part, uh, the present participle there and translated, I declare to you who are still listening. <laughs> what I picture in my head makes me uh, think that Jesus looked out and after doing those blessings and the woes, he looked out and realized a fair number of those people in that crowd had checked out. <laughs> They couldn't go beyond the blessings and those because it was too hard for them. Or literally, some of them may have gotten up and left. But I think his, this statement is still speaking to us today. I, I, I think Jesus is asking us, are you still listening? <laughs> Maybe encouraging us to keep listening to where he is leading us and what he has to teach to us. Then that billboard comes back into my mind. Because what follows, what Jesus says next, isn't all that practical. Or it certainly isn't easy, is it? I've wrestled with this passage several times over my years of ministry. I've always wanted to do it. I, I don't I use a I use a paper, I print it out, I know it some People don't, you know, the worship people don't like it because you're not reading it from the Bible, but it's, you know, I'm getting older. I need that bigger print. <laughs> and I don't think I can hold the Bible. That, no. Um, but I would love to have brought a book that looks like a Bible or something. And then when you get to this passage, go, oh, man, that's too hard. And just start ripping it out. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> It'd freak you out. I know. But, but I'd love to do it just because, I mean, we, we, want, we want so badly just to live in the loving part of Jesus, right? We want that kumbaya experience of Jesus all the time. But that's not what he has to say to us. So for you who are still listening, you are still listening, aren't you? Okay, good. For you who are still listening, listening, what does Jesus have to say to us? Well, <laughs> Jesus says some very challenging, maybe even unrealistic or not so practical things, doesn't he? And he starts off, and all these are in the imperative voice, which means he's saying, do this, right? Do it. It's an imperative. So Jesus says, love. Not only love, but love your enemies. I don't know if we can get beyond that. <laughs> right? 
I mean, we live in a time when this just does not seem like the norm. Maybe it's, it never has been. But it just seems to be heightened. I mean, we are so divided, so quick to judge our thoughts and our words. Those words of hatred, those thoughts of hatred fill our minds so quickly. And unfortunately, too often they spill off our lips, don't they? We are so convinced that our perspectives on life are the right way, the truth, whatever that means which makes it so hard to hear Jesus' words of what it means to love and care for others, and yes, even our enemies. I mean, let's be real. I mean, over the last few days, over the last few weeks, I mean, the first thing in the news is Russia. I mean, it's hard for me to think of loving Vladimir Putin right now, right? So how do we do that? I, I'm not sure that there's an easy answer to that, but he's calling for us to love, even love our enemies. And he challenges us more by telling us to do good, but not only to do good, but to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, pray for those who abuse us, lend expecting nothing in return, I mean, that whole idea of giving to everyone, it's hard. I mean, I, when I visit my daughter out in Port, the Portland area, there are so many homeless people out there, and they're on every corner. It's overwhelming. I can't give to them all. I'd love to. It's, it's impractical. says, don't judge each other. Don't condemn others. Forgive. <laughs> Forgive others. Give yourselves completely to others. We might say all of this is summed up in the golden rule that we hear within there that we should treat others as you would want them to treat you. That would be a good start, but I don't think that's what Jesus, where Jesus sums it all up. And just to remind you that golden rule wasn't first coined by Jesus. It was printed in writings by people way before him, like Homer and Seneca and Philo. But more so, all of this is summed up in Jesus' words in verse 36, where Jesus tells us to be merciful. Just as our Father, God is merciful. Time to start ripping some pages. <laughs> As I told the confirmation youth this past week, we were talking about sex. Um, we were, but you know, we were dealing with the sixth commandment. You know, it, it, it's always a little challenging to deal with seventh graders on that, right? I don't know how Levi handled it, but all right. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality, and then we dealt with the ninth and 10th, we were finishing up the unit, I didn't make them deal with this. I gave them projects of summing up some of the chapters, and I didn't think it would probably be right to sign the sixth one to one of them. So I summed it up, and we ran out of the time before. Anyway, well, but in, in the, you know, the summing up the whole Ten Commandments, and I mean, it's, it's Jesus' command to love one another, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind to love your neighbor as yourself. And I said, the reality is this being a Christian stuff, this following Jesus, isn't easy. It's not for the faint of heart, is it? It's not all loving. <laughs> we are called into some difficult situations. So that leaves us, I think, with the question of what exactly is Jesus telling us today? I'm not sure I've got a great answer for all of it. But let me explain, first of all, what I, I don't think it means. And that is that Jesus isn't asking us to be victims, to remain victims. Uh, especially as we hear the text about uh, you know, turning your, the other cheek and giving up your shirt along with the coat. It's not Jesus saying you have to do so as a victim and, and that you have to take it. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Actually, what he's, I think, doing is a humorous way of nonviolent 
resistance. Let me explain that. I hope this first part makes sense. The second is a little easier to demonstrate. I, I could invite someone up here, but social distancing and all, I better not. But the turning the other cheek is that in that culture, um, if you hit somebody with the palm of your hand or a closed fist, you do so with the right hand. You never hit anybody with your left hand. Everybody know why? There wasn't charm back then, put it that way. Get my drift? Left hand is only used to clean yourself. So you never, it was socially, no, I mean, no one would hit or do anything like that. Everybody, I mean, even when I was in Africa in the 80s, uh, you could not, I mean, we had left-handed people in our group. You don't eat left-handed in that culture, even then. There's no left-handed people in, in, in those cultures. I don't know, you guys have been to Africa, you probably know the same thing, but, um, it's just the way it is. But you would never hit somebody with your left hand. So right-handed, you'd never hit them with the palm if, unless they were an equal. And so here the implication is that you're dealing with someone lower, that you're dealing with a, someone you're trying to oppress. And so you have to backhand them. But if you turn your cheek so they're not able to backhand them, you can picture they're starting to backhand you, but you turn your cheek and they're not able to do so. That means they'd have to come around and hit you with the palm, and they can't, they're stuck. They can't do that because that's putting that person on an equal level. Does that make sense? Jesus is telling us how to be nonviolent resistors. And the same holds true for the coat thing. Because in that culture, um, if an oppressor came to a victim, it would be a, a situation where someone probably owed somebody to this person. And they would, uh, because they couldn't pay them, they didn't have the money or they didn't have the land to give to them, they would take what they could, a coat, for instance. But the other very clearly written understanding is you could never leave someone naked as it's getting towards night. So if you ask for their coat and you give them your shirt also, you, now you're standing half bit naked, right? And the person will go, no, no, I can't do that. Here's your coat back, right? Nonviolent resistance. That's what he's teaching, I believe here. It's pretty humorous. Again, my point is that Jesus isn't telling people to remain victims, but to find new ways of resisting evil. And how do we do that? For us, it's more about what he emphasizes is in loving our enemies. And it's more, it's it's because it's more than just loving those people that are equals with us. It's about loving and treating our friends like we want to and know we're gonna get invited back to dinner or get our money back or whatever it is. And Jesus swings back to and sums it up in a way, like I said, be merciful as God the Father is merciful. But then he also says again, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return. I mean, this is exactly, this is exactly the ethic that Martin Luther King Jr. had, right? wasn't it? I mean, as he knelt with his brothers and sisters of all colors before the water hoses and snarling dogs, it was a way of being nonviolent resistors. Many thought he was crazy. But he knew, and he preached that love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. In the back of my mind, I'm going, yeah, but I don't want him as a friend. <laughs> right? not very practical. It certainly isn't easy. It goes against what we think, what, we, what, what makes sense to us, or at least what we've been told makes sense. But this, what Jesus is teaching us, it's this kind of world that I want to live in. 
It's the kind of world I want to be a part of. I want my life, and I'm assuming you do as well, I want our lives to be shaped by a gospel that is deeper than hatred. To have our lives be shaped by a gospel that is stronger than revenge. This whole section actually starts with Jesus being described as one who has power. He's seen healing people and casting out demons and that power of the Spirit has filled him to be able to bring about change in those people's lives. And I believe that today we are being called once again to live under God's rule, to live in harmony with Jesus and to receive that same power in, in a way that Jesus had received. That power so that we can bring about healing. So that we can lose the hostile spirits that hold us captive. And so that we can not only receive love and mercy, but that we can give love and mercy and that we can live out love and mercy. It may not be practical, but I believe it can, and I believe it will change the world. Amen.
the bottom of page 5. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Indeed, the Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon, upon us in abundance. And so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. So let us pray. Lord, you teach us to love your neighbors, to love our neighbors and our enemies alike. Encourage your church to follow the leading of your love, especially when it is risky or difficult. Help us to show mercy just as we have first received mercy. God of grace, hear our prayer. Nurture fields that lie dormant, resting until it is time to bloom again. Bless farmers and all who cultivate fields and urban gardens. Give favorable weather for planting. Bring forth from buried seeds an abundant harvest and guard against famine and disease. God of grace, hear our prayer. Look upon our world with mercy that we might delight in an abundance of peace. Protect all whose lives are marred by war and civil unrest. We pray especially today for the area around Ukraine. Release political prisoners and amplify the voices that challenge us to seek forgiveness and pursue nonviolence. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your people cry out for mercy. Console hearts that long for forgiveness. Mend broken relationships. Heal bodies that suffer chronic pain or illness. Strengthen and deliver all whose spirits are troubled. We pause now to lift into your care those names who are near and dear to us as we pause in silence to name them before you know. Grant them your comfort and your peace, O Lord. God of grace, hear our prayer. You bind us together into one family. Teach us. Teach us to forgive one another and to resolve conflicts with humility and patience. Bless families of all shapes and sizes and show love to those who are lonely or grieving. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the saints who have inherited the fullness of your kingdom. As you have raised them to imperishable and eternal life, sustain us in faith by the promise of resurrection. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such a great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and in faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please stand as we join in our communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and 
and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take me. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever and ever. This is the Lord's table and all are welcome to it. Uh, as you take the cups uh, and find a way to get into the wafers and into the cup, we will share together the bread and the wine. So you may be seated and then in a moment I'll invite you to eat together the bread uh, and, the, and drink the wine together here. So I'll give you a second to... This will be one thing to be able to celebrate when we you don't have to open these things anymore, right? But it's the right thing to do for a while, so bear with us. Here, I'm, I'm there, don't worry about you, you can eat this whenever, but this is the body of Christ given for you. You may eat. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthened with the richness of your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in, today and forever. Amen. We're closing him as 535, hallelujah. We sing your praises, 535. Just note that the, the verses all, or the chorus and the verses all repeat, so we'll sing the chorus too.